Hi there, it's Billy Tarasio with the Modern Divorce Podcast here back with another episode with one of the modern law attorneys, Ryan Claridge. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for being here with me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, Ryan, we're going to talk about emergency custody orders. And just in preparing for this show, there's so much we could cover. It's hard to even know where to start, but let's start with this. Like, when can someone file for an emergency um, temporary orders petition to get custody of their child? They can file it whenever they want. The, the question which we'll hopefully dive into is when is the right time to file it? And when is it going to work? So as a parent who is sharing custody with someone else um, or about to be sharing custody with someone else, you should look to file these actions when um, something very serious is going on that could physically harm your child. This is more than a disagreement with your, your other, with the co-parent. This is more than, um, more than any, any minor thing. It has to be, uh, your child has to be in serious danger. Um, danger of things as a parent you probably don't want to think about, but dangers of suffering either serious physical harm immediately um, or emotional abuse so bad that it could scar the child forever. Yeah, so the language is you have to establish that if there is not an emergency order granted, it will cause an imminent risk of serious physical, emotional, or psychological harm. Now the physical is fairly clear. We kind of know what that means. Emotional usually means a child is threatening to commit suicide. Um, and that does happen, unfortunately, like more often than, than I'd like to even think about. Now that I think about like how many cases we've had where that comes up, it happens a lot. The psychological piece, I don't know that I've ever seen an emergency motion granted on that. Well, I have gotten an emergency motion granted where there was, um, there was evidence that in the home, the, the mother and the other person in the home were just engaging in all kinds of uh, just verbal and physical altercations. Um, as far as we could tell, the child was not being physically hurt. But this was a you know a single family home. Uh, these people were not using their inside voices, so a child could definitely hear uh, something is going on. And you know, what's the difference between emotional and psychological harm? I'm not sure, but I mean, this is something that you know we think uh, you know a child should not be subjected to. And even though we didn't have any proof, we didn't even have an allegation that the child was being physically harmed. They were just in an environment that could be so damaging. That's why we brought that case. That's a fantastic point. Children witnessing domestic violence or being near domestic violence that isn't necessarily perpetrated at them, but when they're present, absolutely could qualify under right. the statute to get an emergency order. And something um, kind of a corollary to that is it doesn't have to be that the child, unfortunately there are cases where the children are thinking about hurting themselves uh, for whatever reason, um, usually something to do with the custody situation itself. But if one of the parents is unfortunately in a psychological state where they are expressing that to their to their child or even threatening to do that, you know, what if they're the only parent there? Uh, then that child, you know, if something were to happen to the parents, you know, then the child is, you know, unattended um, and potentially witnessing something horrific. So if, I mean, I think everyone, I think 95% of our clients would say their opposing party is a narcissist, right? Um, but if you have evidence that someone is truly uh, bipolar or taking medication for something and they are off the medi medication or they're having some sort of reaction to a, um, some sort of mental health trauma is coming to the surface and they are not addressing it and you have proof, um, that is an excellent time to, to file an emergency motion. That's a great point. The other, the other situation that comes up a lot is with um, suspected drug use, suspected alcohol abuse, or if somebody gets a DUI. Now, what do you think about those situations? So a lot of times, if you're su suggesting drug use, 
what a court will do is they will deny your emergency petition, but they will set another hearing. And at that hearing, they will order drug testing. And depending on the type of drug you're alleging the other party is using, the, the idea, idea there is you know, that 15 day uh, delay isn't gonna allow the other party to, be, to come clean. Now, if you have some proof of drug use besides actual you know, ingestion into the body, if you have a parent that's not showing up for an exchange or a parent that, you know, there's a lot of cell phones now and FaceTiming, if you're FaceTiming with a co-parent and you see, you know, uh, something out of a Motley Crue film in the background happening, like a passed out parent, an overdose parent, a child saying, hey, like my dad isn't responsive right now, um, that would be proof. But just alleging drug use isn't enough. Um, and as alleging alcohol use is almost never enough unless you have some other kind of uh, combining uh, corroborating evidence. Um, alcohol is not illegal in the state of Arizona if, if you're over, over 21. Um, so just drinking usually isn't enough unless there's something combined with it. Marijuana is no longer illegal in the state of Arizona. Um, should you be smoking marijuana around your kid? No more than you shouldn't be smoking a cigarette around your kid. That's probably not enough for an emergency. But if it's causing some other behavior um, that is affecting the child, uh, then it could be an emergency. And you brought up a really good point. Sometimes you don't know if your emergency order is going to be granted. And many times we don't know. Many times we have gone to try to get an emergency order and we're shocked when we get them and we're shocked when we don't. So it's, it's hard to know when a case is going to be granted. I mean, there are those cases that are so horrific that we know it's going to be granted, but most of the time we don't know. But even if it's not granted, the fact that you can get a hearing within 15 days to get a contested hearing, to be able to present your evidence, to be able to give the other party an opportunity to be heard is often a good enough reason to file it, even if you're, even if you're not sure if you'll get that. Correct, because when you're filing an emergency, you're almost, you have to be filing a, a permanent modification as well. Um, so you, you don't want to at a permanent modification hearing that is the underlying petition to modify. Also mention these, all these egregious things that you didn't bother getting emergency for, because that, that you know, could be seen as a weakening of your credibility. What you were saying earlier about the probability of an emergency order being granted or not, I've had cases where I thought I had no chance to get the merchant grant order granted and they're granted and then vice versa as well. And I think part of the reason for that, and we haven't really talked about that yet, is when you file an emergency order, it is without notice. Um, it is also ex parte, which is just a Latin word for saying the other party isn't there. Um, so you're asking the court to temporarily take away uh, parenting time and decision making for someone's child and that parent isn't even there to defend themselves. So it's an incredibly, it's an incredibly high burden um, that you have to allege. And even though the, children, the family court has the children's best interests, certainly their health and safety, you know, at the core of everything they do, they can't take away someone's parental rights even temporarily without really, really clear and convincing evidence. That's a good point. Um, and, and I'm not sure what the actual standard or, of law or the burden of proof is. You know, the, we, we throw out these terms, preponderance of the evidence, clear and convincing evidence, and then beyond a reasonable doubt. Those are the three different levels of proof. But really, it comes down to, does the judge believe that if the judge does not issue this order, removing one parent immediately, that the child will be imminently, seriously harmed? That's Correct. a tough thing to prove. Correct. And, you know, a lot of times we're doing these consultations, if we were to ask the client, what do they really want? They're not going to say, I want temporary 100% parenting time and 100% decision making. They're going to say they want their child to be safe, right? So even in order that you file that does not work, um, the other party is going to find out about it. And, you know, for lack of a better term, often those parties even if they weren't doing anything that rose to the level of an emergency, they will be kind of scared to, and they will act on their best behavior because that underlying permanent petition is coming. Um, so often it can, you know, through, you know, what you might call a failed legal effort, 
you really are accomplishing your objective of making sure your child is safe. I am so glad that you said that because um, I completely agree with you. This happened this week where, you know, we were, there, there was a client who has made, um, you know, reports of abuse um, and those reports didn't end up in a conviction, but they did end up in a, a different arrangement that ensures that abuse is no longer occurring. And, and it's almost always the case that filing something, even if it quote, doesn't work, will have a positive impact on the environment that your child's in. If that parent's using drugs, they're gonna use less drugs. They're gonna be more careful. They're going to be on their best behavior. And sometimes that's what we have to do to hold them accountable. I also think it's a good idea if you have suspicions, like let's say the other parent is spanking your kid and you're not okay with it, but that's not illegal. We can't go get an emergency order. Simply by you emailing, hey, so-and-so said to me, this is happening and he's really concerned and I wanna know if that's going on and if we can talk about it. Even that type of like communication proactively can help make the situation better for your child. Absolutely. And then uh, just a minute or two to we'll talk about uh, what types of evidence to use and more importantly, what types of evidence not to use right? Because oftentimes with your former spouse, the, or the parent of your other parent of your child, there's not a free flowing exchange of information back and forth. So one of the objections you have to overcome is maybe you get a video or maybe you get a text message or a police report that's from six months ago. If you had the police report six months ago and you did nothing about it for six months, you're going to have to convince the judge why you changed your mind. Right. However, if the police report is six months ago and it was there was some attempt to conceal it from you, um, you didn't think it was real. Maybe you thought it was someone trying to stir something up. But if you can show this is when you learned it was real, never mind that date. I hired an attorney and I filed something the day I found out about this, and I don't know if it's still going on or not. Right. So just because your evidence might be a little bit old. If it's new to you and you're taking action of it right away, um, that is helpful. Um, another thing is if it was a behavior, if the other parent and you were married in the past in a relationship in the past, and it was behavior that you tolerated when you were living with the person, like corporal punishment, like um, legal, but maybe excessive drinking or, or drug use, and now you're saying it's a problem, and you said nothing about it in your divorce or your original custody action, again, the judge might have a problem with your credibility. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. And this can be really tricky. Sometimes I'm talking to clients and they're telling me what's going on and it's been going on a long time and they've known it's been going on a long time and I'm horrified and I think we should file an emergency, but we have to get over the fact that mom didn't think it was an emergency up until her attorney told her that that behavior is not okay. That's hard. Or... The flip side, you know, sometimes I have parents who used uh, recreational drugs together and now they, you know, something's happened and you want to go file an emergency order and you have to overcome and face the fact that you may have used recreational drug use or something like that in the past as well. Um, none of it is black and white. All of it is, you know, very specific to the children, to the parties, to the judge and to the lawyer whose job it is to make sure to present your facts in the best possible way. Now, one of the questions I wanna ask you is, who should go get that emergency order? Should it be the party, like the client, the paralegal, which sometimes happens, or the attorney? Sure, so every case is different. Um, in Maricopa County, it's the process is you file the emergency order, and then you go literally you hand it in to the judge's clerk in the hallway and then the judge will take the emergency that day they have to but when they have time sometimes on their lunch break sometimes in between cases and a lot of the time they do it just by looking at what you filed and whatever evidence you filed along with it um, that being said if everyone's available i think the best thing to do is to have the attorney and have the client, the moving party there in case the judge has time to actually hold a hearing 
Um, but Connie needs to understand, the attorney needs to understand that you might be sitting in the hallway for three hours, judge may never invite you back and um, you might lose, right? So filing it is always putting your foot in the ground, it's always letting the court know that this is going on and it will always, if it's true, um, will always help your underlying petition. But as far as who should go, other counties, the attorneys and the clients are required to go. Um, I tend to be over, I prefer to be over prepared than under prepared. But you know, there are times where even your attorney, even at a firm with six or seven attorneys, no one can get there. The only person that can go is a process server or a runner, right? So mm -hmm. um, it, it really right. depends. Yeah, so they're going to make the decision most likely in Maricopa County just based on the paperwork and not talk to anyone, but they have the ability to call you back and ask you questions and you wanna be available to do that whenever possible. Now, my next question is, when what you just described is the process of when you go in and you file and you can go into any courthouse, any superior courthouse, and whatever judge is on call to hear the emergencies will hear that case. The other option is you file it directly with your judge. What do you, do you have a preference or does it de depend on the case? I, I think the emergency, I mean, you really need to get, coach your clients to think about an emergency in the sense, the same way, like, like the police and the fire department do, right? Like you're calling them because something serious is happening. So like, would you call and wait to talk to your, your favorite police officer? You know, if he or she wasn't on duty, probably not. That being said, if you have a prior case history with the judge and the judge is maybe um, at least tangentially aware that this could be a problem in your case, especially if perhaps in the, in the original, whatever created the current orders, be it a divorce or an establishment, if you brought up that, hey, dad is a drug addict and I'm worried about this, the judge said, do some, do some drug testing, show me some clean drug tests and equal time. If you have that same judge and you, and you can kind of have a, I told you so, you made a mistake moment, then I would say, wait for that, that particular judge. Any other time, if it's clearly an emergency, yes, judges are human beings. Yes, they have their own tendencies, but the law here is pretty clear and it really shouldn't matter. It really shouldn't come down to who the judge is if your facts are strong enough. Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's very, very case by case. You know, if the judge is familiar with the issues and you know he or she is already sort of concerned about the underlying behavior, but it's iffy for another judge, then you would maybe want to go directly to that judge. And, and you would just do that by filing it, marking it as an emergency, and then having the JA or the lawyer call and let them know, I've got an emergency sitting in front of you and it's only for you. Um, it's worked sometimes. Other times, it doesn't. And the judge is like, no, go see the on-call judge. So this is all of a judgment call. Now, the next question that I have for you um, is, when should a parent file an order of protection instead of an emergency order? And maybe first you should describe like, what's the difference between filing an order of protection versus an emergency order? Sure, so an order of protection, um, you cannot file on behalf of someone else, but you can include someone else as a protected party like your child. Um, an order of protection, that is something that you file if you believe you will, you personally will be subject to like immediate physical, sometimes uh, harassment type harm. Um, that is with a, you can also do it in the superior court, do it in city courts as well, but we are more familiar with them in superior courts. That I would say has a higher probability for whatever reason of being upheld. Um, that is something that the client prepares by themselves in a every spirit courthouse has a usually near the law library they have an order protection center you go in you type up three or more events at least three that have happened recently hopefully um, and tell the judge what happened and why you need this order to protect you um, you go in that same day um, same time you're at the courthouse and you have a hearing usually with a judge right then and there without the other party present the problem is when we're dealing with family law, you have to describe your relationship 
to the opposing party and you may get directed to family court or what might happen is you'll get the order of protection granted, but they will not include your children on that order. So wait a minute, Ryan, I think, I think we may have gotten a little confused. So, um, are you, so it, are you saying that a parent can go get an order of protection on behalf of the child if the child is abused? You certainly can. You can get an order of protection for yourself um, or you can get an order of protection for yourself if you are also you know, in, in, in a threat of harm and list your child as a protected party. You could also help your minor child get an order of protection against the same abuser. Um, but there, the parent is actually listed as the plaintiff and the uh, protected party is going to be the child. So, yeah. yeah, so if you have a situation where the child's been subjected to abuse, you as the parent have not, you have the ability to go get an order of protection on behalf of your child. Now, the effect of that is a little different than the emergency custody order. The, whatever the family court orders are, they stay in place, except there's this like um, more serious uh, order that says you can't go anywhere near this protected person or anywhere near these addresses. And that can't, you can't do that. Or if you are the defendant and you've been served or you are subject to criminal penalties. So at that point, you can have really competing orders. You can have a family court order that allows for contact and an order of protection that prevents it. Right, so because that kind of almost necessitates a, a, a problem and doesn't provide either the moving party with clear relief or the opposing party with what can I do that is or not legal. That's why I usually try to stay in the family court. What do you, is there a situation where you would not do that, Billy? I mean, there's definitely times when, when I have advised my client to go get an order of protection instead of a, um, an emergency order, the the threshold is different. So you don't have to prove um, serious risk of imminent harm you know, or imminent risk of serious harm. You don't have to prove that. All right. you have to prove is an incident of domestic violence. If you can show an incident of domestic violence within the last six months, you're eligible to get an order of protection. Now it's possible that the judge or the commissioner will say, no, take this to family court. And you're allowed, like you said, to get an order of protection in a municipal court or a superior court, but the law of order protections means it's just easier to get. Any, okay. Anything that meets the, the domestic violence um, definition will allow you to get an order of protection. The real risk is that if the family court thinks you're playing games with the court system, it's gonna hurt you in the long run. That's the biggest risk. Absolutely. and. I mean, because it's a high, it's a high threshold for a reason, and it's a high threshold really for everybody's benefit. If you as the moving party can cross that threshold, um, although every family court judge will say, you know, these temporary orders are without prejudice, they don't have an effect on the permanent orders, not to say that judges are being disingenuous, but you have proven for a moment in time that there was an emergency um, that usually is um, quite convincing evidence in the follow-up hearing and in, in the permanent modification. Um, it really means that whatever events you're alleging, the, the court is agreeing with you that they happened. That's right? absolutely true. So we talked a little bit about burdens of proof and to get that order of protection, the court doesn't just have to believe you. They have to believe you by clear and convincing evidence. You need to bring in evidence that shows that your child was a victim of domestic violence on behalf of the perpetrator. Um, right. You know, that, that, that is usually a very effective thing. I had one case where we did both and the emergency in the family court was not granted. The order of protection was, and we were using medical records where the child had disclosed abuse. Um, now, ultimately, he contested, the, the father contested the order of protection. We decided not to do the hearing. We let the order of protection go because we had a hearing in family court. But because there was that lack of time where we couldn't get an emergency order, it was denied. But we, we really, truly believed the child was in danger. That's why we made that choice. So 
all sorts of risk analysis and balancing factors. And, and it worked out. And I think the fact that in that case, we dropped the order of protection and said, look, we're going to hear this in front of the family court, um, negated the risk of having the family court feel like we were playing games. Sure. And I think to kind of, uh, to kind of wrap this up, if you have what you think are emergency circumstances, um, you should almost always consider filing an emergency. Now, after talking with your attorney, the two of you decide that what is happening is not an emergency. It's not bad news. That means that your child is probably safe, right? So in that case, you would just go ahead and file your permanent modification. Um, if you do decide with your attorney that your child is under, you know, could suffer immediate serious physical or emotional or psychological harm, then you go ahead and file. If you lose, that means the judge thinks that your child wasn't um, subject to those, those evils, which again, um, you might not believe the judge, but might make you feel a little bit better if the judge is able to point out some, you know, some differences some discrepancies and they feel comfortable that your child is safe. If it goes the other way and the judge agrees with you, then you get a piece of paper that says you get to go get your child and provide for their safety until the court can look into this further, usually within about 15 days. So there's never a bad time to discuss these types of situations with your attorney, but you have to keep in mind that the goal is not to, not to pull one over on your former spouse or the, or the father and mother of your children, but to protect your child. And if you have that mindset, you really cannot go wrong, whatever the outcome is. Absolutely true. Thank you so much, Ryan. It's been a great episode and I can't wait to have you back. Fantastic. Bye. Bye.